So many kids watch these movies over and over and over and over and over and over and over. I see some parents out there know exactly what we're talking about. Just watched Intento 190 times. So, I still remember the car ride back home in 2010 after watching Megamind with the whole family and how one person would shut up about how genius this movie was and how much she adored it. That person was my mom, Cinderella. As I remember it, Megamind was one of the first movies that made my child brain go wow. That was deep. It was the first movie that made me think of the balance between good and bad and what is destiny? What is my destiny? Do I even have one? Now that I think about it, I think Megamind kind of gave me my first ever mini existential crisis. I think what sets Megamind apart from every other superhero live action movie Ariel is the fact that with animated movies, filmmakers and writers main goal oftentimes is to think through moral concepts and then build movies around them in order to get across those messages and moral lessons. But with live action movies, the scripts have a very direct approach which very rarely has moral concepts at its core. Most of the time with live action, instead of the deep narrative, industry firstly has the idea of a big war or a fight scene they want to bank on at the end and which characters they want to include and then build the rest of the movie around that. But fortunately for every 50 flashy superhero blockbuster you get one phenomenal animated movie that knocks them out of the park. There is a reason why on Rotten Tomatoes the first and the second places by highest scores in all superhero movies are held by two animated films. Jasmine? Coincidence? I, I think, think not. not! Oh wait, there's something missing here. Perfection. But before we continue, let's talk about today's sponsor and who that might be. Yeah, you don't even have to guess, it's Raid Shadow Legends. I don't think Raid needs a lot of introduction. It's a very, very well-known RPG game that offers not only over 600 champions, but also an insane amount of bosses along with it. And we're gonna talk about one of them today. Hellraiser the Dragon is the guy from the opening cutscene in Raid and occupant of the Dragon's Lair dungeon. He actually used to be a demon quite a while ago, but he got left in the mortal world and now we've got to deal with it in order to get the stolen treasure. The dragon's got two tricks, terrible breath and a host of debuffs and you have to try bringing champions that can clear debuffs and put up shields if you want to try and tank Hellraiser's breath attack. You can also do heavy damage with HP burn and poison debuffs. Raid has a lot going on this month. They have five badass new champions, overhaul of the champion vault and tons of small updates too. Additionally for the entire month Raid's running a huge series of summer splash events where you can get your hands on some of those incredible skins for everyone's favorite dwarf, Trunda. Raid's currently running a special Deliana Chase event where you can also get a brand new legendary champion from the High Elves faction, Amazing Deliana, just by logging in and playing Raid for 7 days between now and July 28th. And for the new players, just enter a promo code MYDELIANA and just like that you'll get 50 XP brews to instantly get your Deliana to max level 50 and ton of silver. You can get started with Raid right now by clicking the link in the description or scanning my QR code right here. And additionally, you get unique bonuses worth of $30. We're talking a free epic champion Aina, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient chart. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. And now let's go back to the blue Baldelian. I think Megamind is to superhero movies what Shrek is to fairytale Disney movies. A movie that does not take its own genre seriously and continuously pokes fun at its tropes while managing to stay original, heartfelt, and true to its own story. This way Shrek and Megamind not only manage to set themselves apart from their respective genres, but meanwhile also accomplish to basically beat most of the things that came before or even after it by their distinguishable, one-of-a-kind, and satiric approaches to their subjects. And I can't stress it enough how perfect of a choice Megamind was in terms of continuing DreamWorks his legacy that started with Shrek. Especially if you consider that both movies feature an anti-hero protagonist who is widely misunderstood by the world that slowly but surely gains acceptance from the public by magical power of self-acceptance. And even though both animations have very many similarities that tie them to the same legacy, they have enough dissimilarities to be considered beautiful and original stories in their own right. You could say that Megamind is sort of an anti-superhero movie the way Shrek is an anti-fairy tale movie. At its surface it looks like a very ugly, unpromising piece of work that only exists to piss off some of those Disney executives, but in reality it has layers. Like, a lot of layers. Like onions. Basically, DreamWorks 
at its best. But both Shrek and Megamind had a disadvantage to be tied to a company like DreamWorks, which even though made quite a few masterful films, differently from Disney and Pixar, the studio lacked consistency and was quite hit or miss with its animation. Therefore, DreamWorks movies, in order to succeed and be remembered, actually had to prove themselves worthy by heavily resonating with its audience. And even though logically Megamind shouldn't have a problem in that regard because it's a flawless masterpiece, you see, there's a reason why this green bad ogre got the attention that this blue bald alien never did. By the time Shrek came out, it was making fun of the genre of fairy tale Disney Renaissance movies that were already sort of extinct at that point. At the very least, at the very end of their run. Like, if you pay attention since Shrek, the types of tropes and ideas that it was making fun of are not that present in the newer modern Disney princess movies, maybe due to ever-growing liberalism or maybe, you know, even Shrek's influence. Hence, Shrek had a privilege of making fun of the genre that already had reached its peak and now was slowly dying down. Therefore, the general public was already familiar and interested in watching a movie that dissected those tropes and concepts present. And this basically made Shrek into an hour and a half long inside joke that everybody was in on. But Megamind did not have that privilege because the genre of movies that it chose to pick on had yet to reach its peak. In fact, it was almost a decade too early. Megamind came out in 2010 and to say that superhero movies were not successful or present at the time would be a complete lie. But today they're much, much bigger. At the time, no one watched Sam Raimi, Spider-Man trilogy or X-Men movies for the sake of wanting to watch a superhero movie. The public wanted to see specifically a Spider-Man movie, to watch an action-packed X-Men movie. But today, just by being a superhero film, the movie can garner a huge interest in the general public because today being a film about people in spandex is enough to elevate society's interest in it. But right now, as the genre has reached its peak with Endgame and more and more people are becoming aware of its repetitiveness and tropes, this would be a perfect timing to release the Shrek of superhero movies. But unfortunately, Megamind was so ahead of its time that this fact brought on its own demise. So let's talk about how that happened. First off, I'm the bad guy. I don't sing. I don't fly off into the sunset. And I don't the bad get the girl. Doesn't get the girl. Maybe I don't want to be the bad guy. Hit it! So let's start with a bang and talk about everyone's favorite subject, the villains. And the thing about the villains is that, more often than not, they only exist to challenge the main hero. I know, revolutionary, am I right? But without one, the other simply cannot be given something to do. Stories require the bad guy to give the good guy a reason to be. Therefore, no movie ever had an ambition to say, wait, what would happen if you took away the hero? What if the villain does take his spot as an evil overlord and we explored exactly what would happen? But that would be so boring. How could there even be a villain without a hero? And I am not talking about the villain origin story. I'm talking about a story about Thanos pursuing his farmer dreams after becoming the most powerful entity in the universe. Can you imagine the power that spin-off would hold? Therefore, fortunately for us, one time in the DreamWorks headquarters, there was an employee that went, you know what would be funny? If we made a movie that did exactly that. And DreamWorks was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Let's do it. So insert a blue alien toddler. And very rarely do you get to see a movie so coherently set up the entire conflict and narrative of the story in such a masterful way in the very first introductory scene. Because this scene establishes everything you need to know about Megamind as a character. You are destined for I didn't quite hear that last part, but it sounded important. Destined for what? The idea of purpose and fate is ever present in his story. It's the most important aspect of his character writing. When he's a toddler, Megamind's parents introduce him to the concept of destiny. Hence, as a young boy, he starts to obsess with the idea of purpose, believing that his fate was already decided, he just had to figure out what it was. Therefore, when other kids reject him for being different and because of his abilities, they deem him a troublemaker, he sees that as a clear sign that he is meant to be the bad guy. And I think we all heard the saying that every bad guy is convinced that they're in the right and that they are the hero. That seems to be the core ideology of every well-written supervillain. And this is what distinguishes Megamind from almost every other bad guy put on screen. 
he is aware that he is a villain, that he is the bad guy, that he is in the wrong. He does not suffer from the false perception that somehow he is the hero of the story. The movie explicitly lets the audience know that countless of times through its monologues, dialogues, and you even right. through its soundtrack. I'll always be a villain. <laughs> This is what makes Megamind so intriguing, the fact that his moral compass is not broken and he has no problem distinguishing good from bad, but he still chooses to be bad because of his unhealthy relationship with the concept of purpose. And unknown to him, this is the biggest problem for him as a villain. The film is written in a way that you get the sense that Megamind as a character is aware of the idea of a classic definition of a supervillain, and he intentionally tries to play into the part. The problem lies where Megamind is able to fake the appearance and superficial qualities of a villain, but he cannot falsify their core ideology, since he does not have one. While most villains become that way because of their cause, Megamite's only cause is to be the villain for the sake of being one. He understands the bad guys just the way they might appear in the most stories, not as effed up people who are driven by actual motives, but as mustache twirling, monologue reading obstacles to the hero's journey. And it makes sense that he creates this Megamind persona while he's still a child. Even though as we get to see in the movie, he's nothing like those generic villains, he intentionally downplays his nature, personal wants, and wishes to make himself appear as single-minded and pig-headed. Throughout the entire movie, he tries to play the role he was not designed for because of his almost childish obsession with the idea of destiny. After Megamind manages to quote-unquote defeat his nemesis Metro Man, we see him act as we expect every generic villain to act after taking over the world, besides obviously becoming a farmer, going through the manic episode of devouring the newfound power and celebrating their victory. But inevitably, after defeating Metro Man, when he begins to feel an unyielding insurgence of identity crisis, he intentionally masks that as something only a prototypically superficial supervillain would lack, a superhero in his life. And again, by doing this, the movie makes fun of the way most stories do not write villains like people, but as obstacles to the hero's journey. Therefore, throughout the entire movie, Megamind's subconscious and nature keep tempting him to break out of the mold of a supervillain. This confusion runs him into a corner since he in fact is not written as a mustache twirling movie guy, he's written as a performer who tries to mold himself into whatever destiny he decides he's designed for. Minion, I'm a villain without a hero. Again, there's no game. A bullfighter with no bull to fight in other words. I have no purpose. Megamind is the first and the only film that explores the concept of if most supervillains actually managed to defeat the hero, their life would be rendered worthless and purposeless because no matter how interesting and fleshed out their motivations, personality, or backstory might be on paper, the only reason they existed in the first place was to drive the plot forward. They were only interesting as long as they had someone to battle with. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is basically how stories work. However, Megamind in the movie is not treated as a classic bad guy, puppeteer, by a plot, but as a person who has actual feelings and autonomy. And Megamind's message applies not only to the villains written in fiction, but also real people, not in terms of being evil, but in terms of struggles with identity. The movie through Megamind's character explores the person who has an unhealthy relationship with their identity and keeps defining themselves only by a single purpose of fulfilling their destiny and the inevitable disappointment and existential crisis that would follow if that obsessive cause is ever reached. Since that single cause is something that this person's life only ever consisted of, which in Megamind's case is just to be bad. Even though the story might come off as one of a supervillain who wasn't meant to be, in reality it's about a person who is obsessed with the false idea of destiny, slowly gaining ability and finding strength in power of choice, independence, and freedom. Funny, I guess destiny is not the path given to us, but the path we choose for ourselves. On this note, let's talk about Metro Man. So last month,
month I watched the movie Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness and what stuck out to me the most was the movie's insistence on asking Doctor Strange the question, are you happy Doctor Strange every 30 minutes or so and me sitting there actually waiting for the movie to indulge and explore that very interesting and intriguing concept of how being a superhero relates to self-fulfillment only to be left disappointed. But I mean, to be fair, they had to squeeze in those 500 fight scenes or so, so it's actually quite impressive they even managed to get me thinking about anything. Really. And it makes sense how this movie was directed by Sam Raimi, the guy who managed to pull off one of the only movies that successfully explored the idea of what if bearing the weight of the universe on your shoulders and risking your neck daily before dinner time might not be the most personally fulfilling job in the universe. And that was with Spider-Man 2, which was in 2004. And since then we've gone hundreds of superhero movies that never even had an ambition to dig deeper than that. And ironically, Jasmine, a children's movie has that exact ambition. It explores the idea of what if the person who was meant to have the super factor did not have a will to be a hero. Megamind poses the question that not many movies of its genre do. What if the person gifted these powers was not destined to utilize them for the greater good of humanity? Hence, the film introduces Metro Man, the character who was born with godlike powers. Our supposed hero, Metro Man, is just as connected to the idea of destiny as Megamind. Both as children had an upbringing in which they were valued only according to their abilities or inability, which caused both of them as children to build their self-worth and identity completely depending on their strengths and weaknesses. Therefore, Metro Man's whole life revolved around being told and believing that because of his powers, his destiny was written and decided for him to serve the people. That was until he had a realization that his entire life was spent going through the motions and daily risking his life without ever having semblance of choice in Independence or freedom. Despite all my powers, each and every citizen of Metro had something I did. A choice. Because from his infancy, his powers dictated his destiny, and his destiny dictated his identity. Metro Man's character asks the question, should a man born with Superman's strength be obliged to disregard their own personal wishes only to serve the people? Ever since I can remember, I've always had to be what the city wanted me to be. What about what I wanted to do? And because of this, differently from Megamind, Metro Man decides to create his own fate and leaves his position as a superhero. From one point of view, this is an irresponsible decision of a selfish man. On the other hand, it's a very understandable choice of a person who was objectified and exploited from birth. Using Metro Man film sends a message that sometimes your gifts do not correlate with who you want or need to be as a person, even if it kind of makes you a selfish a-hole. It's a selfish decision, for sure, but still, in the real world, it would be a completely reasonable line of thinking for a person who basically does not want to throw their life away. And even though all movies avoid this since this type of realism is never cinematic, Megamind has a luxury to be able to pull it off thanks to its satirical nature. And by that, Metro Man's character completely disregards the narrative of literally every superhero movie ever made, that no matter how personally devastated a person might be, they will always choose to remain an altruistic hero. And additionally, Metro Man's personal fulfillment with his job isn't something that comes out of nowhere only to completely clash with the movie's plot in order to sloppily try to deepen the character without dedicating a screen time to it. Like Doctor Strange, Metro Man's actions and monologue completely coincide with the theme of Megamind and the message that it tries to send about the oppressive power of destiny versus the liberating strength of free will. Using superheroes as an analogy, Megamind addresses that we are much more than our inherited gifts or talents, and we should not do define or limit ourselves only to what we can provide to society. It's taken me a long time to find my calling. Now it's about time you find yours. And thankfully for most of us, finding personal happiness is not synonymous with leaving the world to rot. So cheers to that, I guess. Oh, and talking about leaving the world to rot... There is no Easter Bunny, there is no Tooth Fairy, and there is no Queen of England. Being a hero is for losers. It's work, 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 24-7, for what? 
differently from Metro Men, this time we do not explore the concept of a person who was not fulfilled with their life because of their powers, but the concept of what if the person with powers was a complete idiot and a coward. Because most people are idiots, therefore if you go on a quest to give the Ryan Gosling of the most random Joes the power of God, there is a 99% probability that you just created Donald Trump in spandex. Therefore, once again, Megamind takes a very stereotypical idea of a superhero and spins it. Megamind takes Hal, in every other story an underdog character with a nice guy syndrome, and geniusly uses him to flesh out films already introduced concepts even further. Remember when I talked about how Megamind the character is sort of aware of the villain stereotypes in media and intentionally tries to play into them? Well, Titan's character at the beginning does basically the same thing. The movie explicitly alludes to the fact that Hal, aka the Titan, is quite aware of the archetype of a traditional superhero. Therefore, he tries to the best of his abilities to mimic the superhero y stuff popularized by the media, but he ultimately fails since he's not a charismatic Elvis Presley on steroids, he's just a random imbecile on steroids. Being a hero goes against Hal's nature, just like being villainous goes against Megamind's. He's just trying to play the part he was not meant for. And unlike Megamind, because of his self centered nature, it doesn't take Titan that long to realize that he is not suited for the role. Differently from Megamind and Metro Man, in Titan's mind, the concept of destiny or purpose is not that much prevalent. He doesn't bother with existential questions. He only recognizes and responds to such strong emotions as pleasure and pain. And when something does not go the way he wants, he has no problem abusing his power. And here's where the movie starts to take a more traditional route. If he's not meant to be a hero, well, let's make him a villain. Because Titan represents a type of a superhero character who was randomly chosen by destiny according to Megamind. But as we get to see further into the movie, film actively and continuously discredits the concept of fate and destiny. Hal was never destined to be a hero, just like he was never destined to be a villain, just like he was never destined to be powerful. And even though, as I've mentioned, Megamind dismisses the concept of fate, it doesn't completely disregard the idea of luck and how big of a role it can play in our life's trajectory. That sometimes undeserving people get the good deal, while deserving ones get neglected. And if the superheroes were real, they would not be the exception. Therefore, Hall getting powers was just a result of lucky slash unlucky accident. But also, him becoming the villain was not the result of him being an evil douchebag. I mean, he is a douchebag, but not particularly an evil one. Initially, he's pretty harmless, but he's a great example of the most undeserving person getting lucky to get powerful, and later power corrupting their already not so nice nature and elevating their douchebag status to a completely new level by bringing out the worst in them. This is a very fantastic way to showcase that people with greatest power and authority more often than not are not the most deserving ones and shouldn't be blindly worshipped just because they're powerful individuals. That's when a genius scientist decides to artificially neat a potential deadly weapon into a person and mixes unfathomable power with a completely imperfect human who's prone to selfishness and having flaws, you elevate the risks and the damage that could be caused by those same initially harmless flaws. And because initially Hall's main problem is his entitled nature and emotional immaturity, which in normal case are pretty safe, when mixed with the measurable force, they become a ticking bomb. But fortunately, there is this thing about luck. It runs out. And therefore, if a person uses luck as a weapon as opposed to a tool, once it's absent, this person will be left high and dry. And that's the problem with powerful entities. If they solely rely on luck and do not work hard or at least try to maintain the power that was gifted to them for no price whatsoever, once that luck runs out, it's over for them. Titan is a perfect character to oppose Megamind because the contrast between the two perfectly shines the light on how wrapped Megamind's definition and understanding of villainy is. Well, well done. I thought that pattern went really, really well. You can take me to jail. Oh, no, no, no. I was thinking more like the Moor. You're dead. Whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't how you play the game. Game over. Megamind seems completely baffled by Titan's ruthlessness and unwillingness to compromise. Hal has no intentions to play Megamind's game of play pretend. He actually is the villain, and this is the first time Megamind comes to face the true evil. Other than that, Titan goes against Megamind's understanding of destiny. Since the blue alien for the first time in his life has to face the fact that destiny might not appear as simple as he thinks. You stole it! No, 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 you're a hero! Since someone who was seemingly molded to be a hero by destiny actually turned out to be the quite opposite. And therefore, just like with Metro Man, the movie through Titan's character tears down the idea of the chosen one. It makes fun of the absurd notion that destiny and luck somehow have the mind of their own and will always choose the perfect person to bless with their superhuman wonders. That people with the greatest power will always take responsibility. This is the last time you make a fool out of me! I made you a hero! 
you did the fool thing all by yourself. You see, in the most superhero stories as I've observed, you mainly get the three types of origin story. The Superman type of character, when one is born with the superhuman strength. Oh wait, that's literally Metro Man. The Spider-Man type of character, when one is accidentally given the superhuman strength. Wait, that's literally Titan. And lastly, Iron Man, when one is made into a superhero by choice. Oh wait, that's literally Mega Mind. The movie explores all three through Metro Man, Titan, and Mega Mind. With the help of Titan and Metro Man, as I've said above, the movie makes the point that it takes a lot more to make a superhero than just superpowers. The film battles with the superficial understanding of a superhero, the idea that superheroes are synonymous with superpowers. Through its characters, the movie makes a point that being a hero is a conscious choice that a person makes as opposed to superpowers that could be gifted to any random person by accidents or good genetics. And therefore, the decision that out of these three, Megamind is the only one who successfully and happily ends up with the position of a superhero is not an accident on the movie's part. Megamind is the only one out of the three who makes a choice to be a hero, while Metro Men prefer to be a music man, just the way Titan made a choice to be a villain. Our future is never dictated by our legacy, genes, or destiny, but by choices we make as people. And this is one of the core ideas in Megamind. Superpowers do not make heroes, it's people that do.